The following podcast is sponsored by Financial Sense Wealth Management. To learn more about our investment services, go to financialsense.com or give us a call at 888 888- 486-3939. Felix Zuloff is the head of Zuloff Consulting, where he provides institutional research and market strategy on the global macro environment. You can sign up for all of his research and follow all of his work at felixzuloff.com. Felix, it's a pleasure to speak with you on our show again. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you again. It's, uh, it's almost a year since last time we spoke, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, last time we had you on was December 2021. You had a high conviction call that we were seeing a market peak and you were expecting around a decline of 30% into this year, 2022. Uh, We did see the S&P get down from peak to trough of 25% and the NASDAQ a little bit more than that at 35%. So basically, your outlook was pretty spot on. Where do things stand today? Well, I think we are in the later stages of this bear cycle or the cyclical correction, as you may call it. I do believe that we have one more leg down into first quarter of 2023, and that is due to tight monetary policy. The Fed continues to tighten and central banks around the world have tightened. And I think what we will see then is the fallout of this tightening process. So We are looking for a um, very weak uh, world economy in the first half of 2023. Uh, Whether uh, some countries will avoid a recession or not is not so important. The important thing for an investor is to see bad news coming in and that companies begin to guide earnings down and maybe there is going to be a credit event. You know, at some point that usually happens in the economy, the U.S. economy has held up relatively well. I mean, we had two down quarters, but it was basically level uh, for the whole year. And this is due to the stimulus provided during the pandemic. There have been large uh, pools of savings and uh, consumers uh, have been drawing from that pool. I think that pool of savings is slowly eroding. And I do believe that the involuntarily uh, accumulated inventories in Asia, in Europe, and also now in the US and North America, I have to say, will probably go up even more when sales disappoint uh, in the next few months. And if that happens, we are in for some uh, price cutting when the corporate sector wants to get rid of uh, too much inventory. So we'll see some price cutting, which will be very beneficial for inflation to decline. Usually with the weak world economy that we see, commodity prices continue further down. Uh, The energy prices will come a little bit further down, maybe to 60 or $55 uh, for a barrel of crude oil. Uh, And all of that helps the inflation rate to come down. On top of that, we will probably get a whiff of deflation out of China. Uh, The Chinese economy is extremely weak. It is as weak as in the crisis of 2008-2009. And and also they are beginning to provide support. Uh, You will not see that follow through in the real economy in the next few months. And I think you will see some uh, price cuts for traded goods coming out of Asia. So all of that will help bring inflation down. And if we have a credit event or whatever, in, and the market is down uh, 30% or more from the top, I think we get to the point where the Fed believes it's time to change and it's time to ease up. So I do expect Uh, A Fed pivot uh, sometimes in the first half, it could be even late first quarter uh, where the Fed uh, swings around. And then the liquidity situation that has been deteriorating so badly for uh, virtually a year or even more will, will then begin to improve and brighten. And that is when I see uh, markets to turn around And I think we will have a very good bond rally. Uh, I think uh, short-term interest rates are now peaking. Uh, Long-term interest rates may have already peaked or they are in a topping process uh, for a cyclical decline for the next six to nine months. 
and there could be a decline for 10 and 30 years of up to 150 to 200 basis points. So a dramatic bond rally uh, for maybe six to nine months. I don't think it will last 12 months, uh, six to nine months, because if I'm right and the Fed swings around, then I think the commodity complex will begin to find ground, a bottom, and then begin to rise again in the second half of the year. And because the com many commodities are scarce in nature, uh, because uh, due to underinvestment in recent years and due to um, the geopolitical uh, conflict between East and West, uh, I do believe that money will flow into assets that are scarce. And so uh, the price of oil and metals, et cetera, will go up. And I could easily see that in 24, uh, oil could trade at 150 to 200 dollars. Uh, so this is what I say is in 23, we make the cyclical low in inflation. Uh, we make um, a bottom later in the year in bond yields, and the bottom may be around the middle of the year in commodities, and then up again, commodities up, inflation up, bond yields up into 24 or even 25 and probably by dramatic proportions. Um, that means for equities um, uh, from a major low in the first few months, we should see a good first up leg in the growth segment of the equity market when uh, the growth stocks will be bought and they will perform very well in sync with declining bond yields. Uh, and then I think in the second half of the year, the leadership will change to the commodity related uh, equities, uh, value cyclicals, uh, stocks, and, uh, and particularly energy, and they will carry the market through into a peak in 24. That is my working hypothesis, and this is how I see the world. Okay, so for those that did follow your framework calling for a peak in late 2021, we at our own firm were also raising cash at that time as well, all the way into early 2022. At this point, it sounds like if I've gotten what you said correctly, you're seeing this as more of a bear market rally within a longer term decline, which you don't think we're going to see perhaps the final low into the first quarter or at least the first half of next year. Did I get that correct? It could be a bear market rally for the growth stocks. Uh, because it will be a bear market rally for the bond market. But it could also be the next big bull cycle for the commodity-related segments, like energy. So energy bottomed in 2020, and actually energy was up a lot this year, and we'll probably have a correction over the next few months. And then it will start its next major up leg to new highs. Uh, together with what I said about the uh, price of oil. Uh, so I think you have to differentiate between the different segments of the market. The growth segment performs much in line with the bond market. And in bonds, I do not see that bond yields go back to the lows that we have seen in 2020. Uh, and actually in 2020, I turned very bearish bonds. Uh, I, I even wrote a report, the sell of a generation. And I actually wrote a report, Buy of a Generation, in 1981. Uh, so uh, I, I do not see bond yields going all the way back to the lows, but maybe halfway or so, something like that. And uh, therefore, it is conceivable that the uh, growth stocks, that they could not go back to the highs that we have seen, but only retrace part of the bear market they have suffered. And, and then go into the next bear market from a lower high from 24 onwards. That is conceivable. I'm not as certain as I was about my bearish call in late 21, but uh, that's my working hypothesis. I will buy growth stocks at the low, sometimes in the first few months of 23. And that's the most important thing. But I think the leadership will really be more value and cyclical stocks and particularly those related to commodities. And commodities because 
you have to take into consideration that the world is deglobalizing. The world is breaking apart again into two camps, the autocratic countries and the democratic countries. And the Middle East as, the, as a major energy producer and OPEC plus is in the autocratic camp. And therefore, I think those items that the autocratic camp produces and is a major producer, you have to be careful because those commodities could remain very scarce and get scarcer. And therefore, the prices of those items could be bid up uh, much more dramatically due to an intensifying geopolitical conflict that I see. Therefore, the leadership will not be in the growth segment, but will be in the commodity-related segment. You know, energy, agricultural stuff, uh, metals, the whole, the whole thing, everything related to those themes. And along those lines, one of the things that we've been discussing now for at least a year, probably two years on our show, and a number of guests have brought this up as well, even just recently, uh, Jim Walsh at Macrotides, but this idea that we could be looking at a period of time of stagnant returns for potentially up to a decade, if not more, similar to what we saw during the 1966 to 1982 time period, where stocks really went nowhere. It was a volatile trading range, if you will. And at the same time, you saw an outperformance more in the commodity space. Is that somewhat of a similar view that you think investors should keep in mind for what we could see in the years ahead? I think that's a very important point. Uh, I do believe that the passive index type of portfolio will deliver very poor returns over this decade, let's say 10 years out. The returns will probably be near zero, plus or minus one or two percent, very low returns. But I also call this decade the decade of the roller coasters. So I think we will see dramatic moves up and down and in different segments. And, and therefore, you cannot operate with a passive index type portfolio or a 60-40 portfolio and expect a return like in the last 10 years. Uh, the return will be much poorer. So to really uh, achieve a return that pension funds want to achieve, 8% or more, they need that for their liabilities, to match the liabilities. Then you have to time these cyclical swings, and you also have to be good in selecting the themes that dominate. That's a very challenging uh, task. And, and I think... The current uh, generation of portfolio managers and investors is spoiled by the environment we have seen in the last 20 years, basically, where they could sit with a passive portfolio indexed and achieve a decent return around 10% or whatever. And that will not happen again. That cannot be repeated. I think it will be very different. Yeah, one of the big macro themes, and I know this is something that you've been discussing regularly, and we discussed this with you last time, is what we see going on in China. As you mentioned, you know, we're moving into this era of deglobalization, and this is going to define a lot of trading, a lot of positioning, much of the investment landscape for many years to come. What do you see in China? Because so much of the commodity space and energy space is tied to you know, rumors about zero COVID. At first, it was thought that they were going to lift and that they were moving away from restrictions. And then they saw this big spike in COVID cases, and now they've had to double down. So, so much of what's happening in the commodity space is based on just policies out of China, which we don't have a lot of transparency on. China is very important to the world economy because it's a, it's a major factor nowadays. And when you look at the world, the trade by China with the rest of the world is bigger than the trade by the US with the rest of the world. Actually, in the vast majority of countries, China is the more important trading partner than the US. Most Westerners are not aware of this, but, but that's a fact. I think China has come up so quickly and so far the progress was mind-boggling. And I think that peaked and culminated in the biggest infrastructure boom and credit boom and real estate boom humanity has seen in its history. 
And I think it's very similar. The situation today is very similar to the early 90s where Japan stood. Japan had a big boom for years and years and years and easy money and, uh, and pyramiding in the stock market and the uh, credit boom was the same thing. And the Japanese banks dominated international banking at that point of time. I think it's very similar. What happens with that boom is now the banking industry is very weak. The banks have 2% equity capital. They are undercapitalized. They are expecting uh, rising non-performing loans. Officially, they show 1.7% or so, but inofficially, it's probably more, which would wipe out the, the asset base or the equity base, uh, basically. So it's a very uh, difficult situation. The loan to deposit ratio is by far bigger than anywhere else in the world, which means altogether that Chinese banks are unable to finance future high growth in China. The industry first has to be recapitalized, and that means that we have to go through a process of restructuring in the real estate sector, in the construction sector, in the finance sector, etc. And that will take years. It took Japan 20 years. It, uh, if I'm optimistic, I say it will take uh, China 10 years at least because the excesses have been bigger. That means that China cannot grow very well over the next few years. And that means the growth rate of China naturally has been lowered dramatically to Western standards at, at best. Uh, and, and that means that the Chinese have trouble to understand that and to accept it and to communicate that to the world. And I think they are using this virus situation uh, as a cover-up, as a camouflage, so to say, internally as well as externally to say, yes, we have a weak economy, but it's due to the lockdowns, et cetera, et cetera. You know, PCR tests cannot differentiate between the flu and COVID. We know that in, 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 in the meantime. At the beginning, we didn't know. And this right now is the flu season in China and the flu season runs until early March. And therefore the numbers are going up. And I think they are using this lockdown. The protests, I think they have handled extremely well, very measured, very calm and quietly, nothing uh, aggressive from the side of the authorities. And I think the central government is directing all the provinces now to go easier, and I wouldn't be surprised to see some uh, lifting of some restrictions in the near future. And eventually, by the beginning of March, most of the restrictions will be lifted. That will come right at the time when I think the markets uh, are about to bottom out and good news are to follow. So it all plays, even China plays into the hands of the scenario that I outlined. No, that's very interesting, and I appreciate you sharing that with us. So just to recap some of what we discussed today, you know, you're looking at a little bit more of a bear market rally here, and then you think that we are going to see another leg down in 2023, largely because central banks are still remaining in their tightening posture. A very weak economy in the first half of 2023, as you mentioned, high inventory levels still need to be drawn down. You think we're going to see likely a whiff of deflation out of China in that first half of 2023 timeframe, you're looking at March in particular as uh, a period of time in which we may see some of those restrictions finally withdrawn given the flu season. Hopefully they'll start to distinguish between the flu and COVID cases as well, which would be a, a good sign. And some of the places that you're looking for where uh, there might be some attractive opportunities, as you said, we could be looking at a very good bond rally for six to nine months. Uh, we could see oil, as you said, get as high as $150 to $200 up until maybe the 2024 timeframe. So you're still structurally bullish on energy there. And we may see a good first up leg in the growth sector and then more of a transition to leadership from growth tech to value and cyclicals in the second half of 2023. And active management in this period of time will likely be more necessary 
given the roller coaster that you're expecting for the markets ahead. Would you say that that is a fair characterization of your view or would you like to change or add anything to that? No, that is that is pretty much what I said. I, I think uh, in, in the first quarter, the cyclical decline that started at the beginning of this year will be terminated, will terminate. And then we go into a new bull cycle. And that's important for investors to understand. That bull cycle could then run into 24. And after 24, I don't want to talk too much about it, but my view then gets very dark for a major systemic uh, problem. Because if I'm right on the commodities, then we will have double digit inflation rates in, uh, in 2024 uh, and 25. And you can imagine where bond yields will be. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see 10-year treasuries at 8 to 10% at that time. And that gives you an idea of where stocks uh, could go on the downside after the 24 peak. And it sounds like that outlook does align with kind of what we saw during the 70s, uh, particularly if we were to take that 1966 to 1982 time period where, you know, we see central bankers try to take a stand against inflation. They raise rates. We see inflation come down, moderate at first, but then we see it come back again with a vengeance, in which case, you know, that becomes more negative for the outlook. Yes, yes, but with one major difference. Uh, in the 1970s, we had very positive demographics. And the demographics uh, created the strong underlying demand in our economies. This time, it's just the reverse. It's the opposite. We have very weak demographics. And this is an underlying weakness of final demand in our economies, for the next few years to come. There will be cyclical swings, but the structural trend of final demand will be weakening constantly. And that is a big problem for our system. And particularly if interest rates uh, go as high as I expect into the mid 2020s. Well, Felix, I want to thank you for coming on our show again and giving us an update on your outlook. As we close today, would you mind telling our listeners a little bit more about your website, your services, and how they can get in contact with you and follow your research? Well, you can find us on www.felixzulau.com. And there you can uh, ask for um, information uh, about our market letter which is institutional research. And uh, we publish about every two weeks or so, or even in a shorter interval, if the market requires, and hope to be of help to investors in this volatile world. Well, Felix, once again, you made an excellent call when we spoke with you last time, calling for a market peak. That's exactly what we saw. And you had said that you were expecting, you know, around a 30% decline. And again, the S&P fell Peak to trough, 25, NASDAQ, 35%. Uh, but you don't think that that is over and maybe looking at another whiff of deflation as we look towards the first half of next year. But it will soon be over. It will be over in, in the first quarter. And then uh, I'm quite bullish uh, for the following 12 to 18 months or so. Okay. Definitely want to encourage all of our listeners to go to felixzuloff.com, follow Felix's work there. And Felix, pleasure speaking with you on our show again. We look forward to having you on in the future. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, Chris. Thank you. If you have any questions or feedback on what we discussed today, or if you'd like to get in touch with us about our asset management or financial planning services, you can do so by going to financialsense.com and clicking where it says contact us. As always, don't forget to spread the word about FS Insider with your friends and family and share our podcast on all of your social media channels. For FS Insider, I'm Chris Sheridan. Thanks for listening. The Financial Sense News Hour is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the News Hour each involve their own unique risk factors, which are not discussed on the show. Responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the Financial Sense staff and do not take into account listener suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Financial Sense News Hour and its parent company shall not be liable for any financial losses that result from investing in any company 
companies mentioned in financial sense or arising out of the use of any material on the news hour. Be advised that you invest at your own risk.